Welcome, everyone. So let's get started with today's uh, grand rounds. Uh, I'm going to just have uh, the slides uh, show up uh, to help us get through the cardiology um, grand rounds. Uh, the link for the YouTube channel where all the meetings and the grand rounds reside. And then for today's um, divisions uh, grand round CME credit, please text right now 17011. 17011 to the number 888 The reason I repeat this is because many times people forget to take their CME credits. This is your one chance to get your credit and your MOC certification. So uh, please uh, try to get this done uh, within the next 12 hours. So the session will be open. The window is open for the next 12 hours. And if you are a physician who's interested in maintaining uh, the certifications, then today's uh, uh, room code is future 37. And the link that is displayed here is going to come back into uh, the chat box one more time. And you, may, you will be able to get your MOC credit if you answer the questions correctly. And it goes directly into your ABM ID in the cloud CME profile. So one more time, your CME credit. And if you complete the CME credit and the MOC points together, then you physicians can get their uh, ABM MOC credits as well. All right, so without further ado, now it's my honor and privilege to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker. Uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Harvard Eisen. Uh, Dr. Eisen, uh, is a very well-known figure in the heart failure community and, and the cardiology community. Um, but I'm going to give a brief introduction. This is a great opportunity for uh, any, any introducer to go through the CV. And I was profoundly impressed uh, how wonderful his accomplishments have been. He uh, did his uh, MD from University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in 1981. And he did his internal medicine residency in uh, at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He then did his cardiovascular fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis Barnes Hospital and completed this training in 1987. He was then an assistant professor of medicine and medical co-director of the cardiac transplant program at the University of Pennsylvania. In 1993, he moved to Temple University School of Medicine to be the medical director of the heart failure and the cardiac transplant program, which became one of the largest ones in the country. He then rose to the rank of professor of medicine and physiology at Temple. In 2005, Dr. Eisen was uh, appointed as Thomas J. Vishay Professor of Medicine and Chief of Division of Cardiology mm -hmm. at the Drexel University College of Medicine and Hanuman University Hospital. He subsequently was also installed as the Joseph D. Palma, MD, Family Professor of Cardiology. Subsequently, he moved on uh, to uh, the Pennsylvania State University Hershey Medical Center. And he was, he's been since then the Professor of Medicine tenured and also the Medical Director of Cardiac Transplant, Mechanical Circulatory Support and Advanced Heart Failure Programs. Uh, Dr. Eisen has been extensively involved at, with multiple organizations in cardiology, uh, ranging from ACC, AHA to the heart transplant uh, uh, organizations. He is the associate editor of the American Journal of Transplantation. He was the deputy editor of clinical transplantation, associate editor of transplantation uh, till 2017. And he was also a guest editor for Circulation in 2018. And he serves in multiple uh, editorial board capacity and specifically Journal of Cardiac uh, Failure uh, till present. Uh, Dr. Eisen's uh, claim to fame has been his role in uh, mentoring young people and also his role in clinical trials, specifically his uh, role as a senior author and chair of the steering committee for the uh, clinical trial comparing Everolimus to uh, 
uh, to microphenol morphotil in cardiac transplant patient. And this was the largest clinical trial ever performed in cardiac transplantation. He has been in forefront uh, for the development of gene expression profiling in cardiac transplantation patients. And, and he has had uh, a successful career also uh, in research. Specifically, he has chaired AHA research study section and has been a member of NIH study section. In fact, I had an opportunity to be a co-member uh, on one of the NIH uh, study sections together, which we uh, participated just a couple of years back. And when I get to, got to know him. Uh, Dr. Uh, research, uh, uh, Isaac's research has been grant funded extensively by multiple sources, uh, uh, including sponsored trial, clinical trials from the industry, American Heart Association, uh, of which he was an est established investigator, the NIH. And he has contributed to over 200 plus publications, textbook chapters, editorial abstracts. And most importantly, uh, he's been the uh, chair for the ISHLT 2023 scientific program recently. And lastly, but not the least, we are absolutely thrilled and privileged that he has accepted to join us in the uh, rank of section chief of the advanced heart failure. So we are really looking forward to this journey ahead. There are some last pieces of paperwork that are yet to be completed, but um, uh, Dr. Eisen is, uh, is committed and we are really looking forward to this journey uh, forward along with him. To join him on the panel today after his presentation will be Dr. Deepa Iyer. And hopefully uh, together we'll have a, a stimulating conversation on where the field of cardiac transplantation and pharmacotherapies are moving towards. With that, I welcome both of you, Howard, uh, Harvey, you and Deepa, both of you. And now is the time for Harvey for us to take you through your presentation. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Sengupta. Let me, um, I believe I'm still sharing. Does everybody see my slides? Not as yet, Harvey. Oh, okay. Um, you yeah, have to reshare the slides, Dr. Uh, oh, let me share them. That's right. Here we go. Okay. Um, all right. Does everybody see them now? Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the evolution of um, heart transplant over 50 plus years and then talk about where we are now. And there's some very exciting things that are going on in terms of transplant and managing patients with advanced heart failure. But let's go way back in the 1960s. I have nothing financial to disclose. I will talk about the off-label use of Everolimus approved by the FDA for renal and liver transplant and outside the U.S. for cardiac transplant and Serolimus approved by the FDA for renal transplant. So the objective is to understand how cardiac transplantation is developed, be able to identify current immunosuppressive therapy for heart transplant, and become knowledgeable about biomarkers, including molecular diagnostic testing and donor-derived cell-free DNA for detecting rejection, cardiac allograft vasculopathy. But let's go back to December 3rd, 1967, when the first transplant was done. It really captured the imagination of the world. And I, I was in elementary school, but I certainly remember this. Very exciting. Um, we're now 50, we're now 53 plus years ahead of uh, that and over 150,000 transplants. Dr. Christian Barnard um, was the surgeon who first did this. He was a South African. He received his training at University of Cape Town, but then came to the United States, uh, did cardiothoracic surgery training at the University of Minnesota, set up the first cardiac surgery program in South Africa, Rutuskure Hospital, and observed Dr. Norman Shumway at Stanford before heart transplants in animals. Um, and this is Dr. Uh, Barnard. Um, the first transplant, as I mentioned, was performed in December 1967. He performed animal kidney and heart transplants at Stanford. The longest lived patient who was transplant of his was transplanted in 1969, lived 24 years. He performed 48 orthotopic, 10 heterotopic transplants before his program and most around the world were suspended because of bad outcomes. This is Grutuskure Hospital. Grutuskure means big barn. And 
In here is the Heart Transplant Museum, which shows the operating theaters and various things about Dr. Barnard. And I've been getting pictures from this museum for years because my patients would go down there. It was like a pilgrimage site. Here is Dr. Barnard with Sophia Loren, Dr. Barnard with Golda Meir, Prime Minister of Israel, and there are pictures of him with everybody, the Pope, Lyndon Johnson, you name it. The first heart transplant was Louis Wiskanski, who was in his 50s, had ischemic cardiomyopathy and diabetes. And back then there was nothing that could be done. Uh, the donor heart um, was from Denise Darval, who was killed in an auto accident. It's not clear if she was brain dead. There was no real way of assessing brainstem function. She may have been the first uh, heart donated uh, after cardiac death because they um, basically took her off the respirator, waited for her heart to slow down. She was in the adjacent OR and took her heart out and transplanted her. Mr. Wyshkansky died 18 days later from pneumonia, likely from immunosuppression. Um, but he was treated as if he had rejection, which made things worse. Um, so just keep the number 18 in your mind because it'll come back. The second South African transplant and third transplant worldwide was Philip Blayberg, 59, ischemic cardiomyopathy with multiple MIs. His donor was a multiracial man, and he survived 19 months, succumbing to cardiac allograft vasculopathy, the transplant coronary disease, the first. Um, person known to have succumbed to that. The second transplant was done in the U.S. in Brooklyn in December um, 1967. And ironically, the transplant coordinator would many years be later, many years later, be the wife of uh, one of my transplant patients at Hahnemann. She was the first U.S. transplant coordinator, and they actually lived uh, not far from from New Brunswick. They lived in Princeton. So I had mentioned to Dr. Sengupta, Cornell, where I went to undergrad, as you enter the Cornell campus, this is the first sign you see, rough road ahead, which kind of sums up four years of education at Cornell, but also sums up the next few years of, um, of heart transplantation. So these are the early immunosuppressive therapies, the only things people had available. Azathioprine was a failed leukemia drug, corticosteroids, early anti-lymphocytic antibodies. This is azathioprine. And this is the cover of Life magazine in 1971, The Tragic Record of Heart Transplants. I got this, the full uh, journal from one of my patients. Maybe she was trying to um, say something to me, but if you read this article, it's absolutely stunning. All of these people on this cover died. And at the Texas Heart Institute, um, cardiologists were barricading OR doors to prevent people from getting transplanted. And you see up here, a new report on an era of medical failure. So it went from this incredible optimism to this disaster. So what happened? Well, this is the immune response, the alloimmune response. And this is a really good article if you want to know about this. It's a oldie but goodie, 2004 from Philip Halloran, who's a transplant immunologist. And so it shows the various pathways involved in the immune response against the transplanted organ. So you can see it's very, very complex. And in 1967, the surgeons could put the heart in, but after that, they just prayed because they had no idea what would happen next. But these guys figured it out. This is Peter Doherty from Australia, Rolf Zinkernagel from Switzerland. They got the 1996 Nobel Prize for the discoveries of how the immune system recognized foreign antigens, for example, in donor hearts. And that led, and, and this work was done in 1974, seven years after the first transplant, but that led to the development of, ultimately the development of immunosuppression. So this is the alloimmune response. Um, these are T cells responding to the transplanted organs um, uh, uh, antigen presenting cells, and they present um, fragments of the HLA antigens to these cells, and the T the recipient cells can also recognize it directly, um, and that results in cytokine elaboration, activation, activation, proliferation of T cells, production of antibodies, 
and activation of macrophages, that they all go off and destroy the transplant unless something is done. So I just discussed this. So there's a wave of immune cells. And so the primary goal of immunosuppression is to blunt this allomune response and prevent rejection. And, um, and the other thing is, as a result of these cytokines, the cells of the allograft produce more of these MHC class one and two antigens or HLA antigens, um, which makes the transplant even more of a target to the immune system. So let, let's talk about Norman Shumway for a second. Norman Shumway is viewed, I think appropriately as the, really the person who got transplant going and then continued to have it move along. He was from Minnesota, went to Stanford in 1958 and started doing um, kidney and heart transplants in dogs. Um, and tried to tinker around with immunosuppression. He did his first transplant in January 1968. This is the person, the 56-year-old person, lived 14 days and succumbed to hepatic failure, though the heart was functioning well to the end. Despite poor outcomes, and this is where Dr. Shumway is so important, he persevered, assembled a talented team of surgeons, cardiologists, nurses, to continue to perform heart transplants. Uh, they did the first heart-lung transplant in 1981. And then they hit gold in um, when they started using cyclosporin, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But this really enabled heart transplant to take off. So over 1,300 heart transplants have been performed at Stanford. And it really is sort of the mecca of transplantation. A lot of people around the world uh, go there to train in heart transplant. This is the 50th anniversary of Dr. Shumway's um, first transplant at Stanford. This is cyclosporin. So you see it's a cyc cyclical um, um, drug and it's found from fungi as a lot of these immunosuppressive agents are. And it's the first relatively specific immunosuppressive agent. So what does it do? It prevents um, uh, expression of interleukin-2 which causes T cell activation and proliferation. And so you see, once it was introduced in the early 80s, the number of heart transplants went up dramatically as the survival improved, rejection became less of a problem, and actually the number of transplant programs increased as well. And where I got involved was in 1985 when I was a fellow at Wash U, and we recruited a um, very talented uh, transplant surgeon Chip Bowman, who was one of the founders of the triple therapy approach, where you use moderate doses of immunosuppression that are synergistic and don't have the excessive mor morbidity. And, um, and actually, so he taught me immunosuppression. And back then, um, the cardiology attendings didn't believe that this thing was going to take off. They said, oh, you know, we tried this before. This is ju just some surgeon's vanity project. So our division chief tasked two of us fellows to become the transplant cardiologist. And it really was in a defining moment for my career. So we're back here again. Let me just show you uh, where some of these drugs work. So um, cyclosporin works here and um, blocks calcineurin, which is involved in, in um, generating transcription factors that produce interleukin-2, which is over here. And then there's some of the other drugs we use are antiproliferatives, azathioprine, mycophenolate, which block proliferation of, um, of, uh, of T cells. And some of the other drugs you'll see will be the mTOR inhibitors. So one of the earliest randomized clinical trials was using statins. And this is Gabashi Gawa's work on the left, where he randomized patients to pravastatin or control. And what he found was that not only was survival better, but there was a reduction in cardiac allograft vasculopathy, less mortality, and then from rejection. And it's always good if studies can be reproduced. And a group in Germany used Simvastatin, and Venki um, and his group, and they showed the same thing. So suddenly statins became standard therapy for all transplant recipients. And the mechanism here was not related to lipid lowering. It's due to the statins anti-inflammatory effects. So the same thing that allows statins to stabilize the um, unstable plaque enables 
um, statins to reduce um, inflammation, reduce rejection, improve survival. And these are long-term data showing the, the pravastatin group did better than the control group in terms of survival and freedom from cardiac, cardiac allograft vasculopathy and death. The first big clinical trial was the mycophenolate bofetil study trial comparing MMF to azathioprine. So this is comparing two antiproliferative drugs, um, plus cyclosporin and prednisone and induction therapy, which is usually antibodies. It's a three-year trial. And what it shows was a reduction in mortality, reduction in rejection, reduction in rejection with hemodynamic compromise. So as a result of this, this was seen three years out, as a result of this, MMF essentially replaced azathioprine as an immunosuppressive agent. There was an effort to see whether it had an effect on cardiac allograft vasculopathy. So there was quantitative angiography, intravascular ultrasound, which really didn't show a significant benefit. Um, and keep an, remember IVIS because we're going to talk about it later when we get to the mTOR studies. So rejection is the major early problem in these page patients. The response of the immune system to the um, to the allograft and the way it was diagnosed was doing using the biopsy endomyocardial biopsies to abstain, obtain small pieces of myocardium and look at the degree of cellular infiltration and myocyte necrosis. And this was developed in 1973 at Stanford by Philip Caves. This is the, um, the grading schema, which on, on the left is what we use now. So this is where we treat to our moderate rejection, three R severe rejection. So these are mild, these are all one R. You see some lymphocytic infiltrates, but no myocyte necrosis. And this is a two R with more extensive lymphocytic infiltration, infiltration and myocyte necrosis. And these are three R, these are all to be treated. More extensive lymphocytic infiltration with myocyte necrosis. And here are inflammatory infiltrates. So the immunosuppressive agents that were used, I mentioned triple therapy, moderate doses of three different types of drugs with different uh, mechanisms. So the calcineurin inhibitors, which inhibit T cell proliferation, activation, mycophenolate, nasothioprine, which um, uh, inhibit T cell proliferation by inhibiting purine synthesis, and corticosteroids, which do all sorts of things, but they inhibit cytokine elaboration. And uh, um, so this is where calcineurin inhibitors work and they inhibit IL-2 production, antiproliferatives inhibit the cell cycle, target of rapamycin, sirolimus and everolimus work here and inhibit um, um, proliferation as well. So another major clinical trial is one that we call the three-arm trial because there's three arms here. So patients were randomized to get either tacrolimus or sirolimus, tacrolimus or MMF, or cyclosporin or an MMF. And what we saw was that patients who got tacrolimus and MMF had um, the best um, profile of survival, rejection, and, and relatively few side effects. So that's how tacrolimus and MMF overtook cyclosporin and MMF. Cyclosporin is here. Um, Crolum is up here as the major immunosuppressive therapy that's used. Well, let's talk about mTOR inhibitors because something near and dear to my heart. Um, the uh, mTOR inhibitors inhibit T cell proliferation as well as proliferation of other cells, such as vascular smooth muscle cells, in response to endothelial, endothelial injuries. This is very important. This is where they work. And um, um, they've been used in heart transplant. But even before that, they were used to inhibit vascular smooth muscle proliferation in another type of um, vascular injury. And this is drug-eluting stents. So this is the European Revell trial where patients are randomized to serolimus eluting stents versus uh, bare metal stents. There was dramatic reduction in restenosis and improvement in event-free survival. There was an American trial, uh, got the same results. So how does this happen? Well, when you deploy a stent, it injures locally, injures the endothelium uh, and the vasculature that produces vascular smooth muscle cell proliferation. So using donor derived, I mean, uh, using um, uh, um, 
So the role in the saluting stents produces um, uh, an inhibitor to vascular smooth muscle cell proliferation. So you get less restenosis. However, you also get less endothelialization because it inhibits endothelial cell proliferation, which is why these patients require much longer courses of, uh, of antiplatelet agents. Well, let's get to heart transplant. Now, heart transplant, you have to administer these drugs systemically. So there was a clinical trial in Australia and New Zealand randomizing sirolimus against two doses of um, uh, two doses of sirolimus versus azathioprine. The endpoint was rejection, but they also did IVIS to look at progression of cardiac allograft vasculopathy. So there was less rejection with sirolimus than with azathioprine. Uh, there was less herpes simplex. This is important. The mean serum creatinine was higher in these patients. Um, there was no difference in malignancies. And this is the IVIS data. So this is azathioprine in the red, sirolimus in the green. And what they did is they looked at the change from baseline to six months. There was much more progression of patients of cardiac allograft vasculopathy defined by IVIS with azathioprine compared to sirolimus. Oops. So sirolimus in immunosuppression lowers six-month rate of acute rejection, produces increased creatinines, despite the fact that the cyclosporin levels are the same, and the progression of graft vessel disease was significantly reduced in sirolimus-treated patients. Well, the rest of the world looked at a different mTOR inhibitor, everolimus, also known at the time as RAD, and I had the honor of leading this clinical trial. So patients are randomized to one of two doses of everolimus versus azathioprine, and the, the composite endpoint was biopsy-proven rejection, rejection with hemodynamic compromise, graft loss, death, or loss to follow-up. And so most of the differences in the endpoint was due to, were due to a de decrease in 2R or 3A rejection uh, in the everolimus groups compared to azathioprine. Now, you be, may be saying, now, wait a minute, Dr. Eisen, you just showed us that MMF is better than azathioprine. How come they didn't use MMF? Well, the problem was MMF was not approved by local health authorities um, yet in most of the countries in the clinical trial. It wasn't approved yet when we did the study, late 90s into the early 2000s uh, in the United States. So we had to use the only uh, anti-proliferative that was available. We did have an IVIS clinical trial. And um, so we did one at baseline, then we did one at one year. And um, what we looked at was change in maximal interval thickness from um, baseline to one year because it was known already from observational studies that a change of 0.5 millimeters um, in terms of maximal interval thickness from zero from baseline study to one year increased the risk at five years of sudden cardiac death, heart failure, and myocardial infarction. So what we here see here is less development of maximal intimal thickness in the everolimus groups compared to azathioprine. And if one looked at a variety of other measures of, of cardiac allograft vasculopathy, those are also um, blunted with everolimus. Here's others. And we also looked at the incidence, cardiac allograft vasculopathy, which we define as a change greater than 0.5 millimeter increase from baseline, the maximum, to, to, um, to one year. So this would be a patient who has cardiac allograft vasculopathy with this definition. Maximum intimal thickness here is zero, and here it's 0.7. So the incidence was lower in the two everolimus groups compared to azathioprine. But as I'd mentioned in the Australian serolimus study, there was evidence that some evil things were going on. Creatinine clearances were lower in, um, in the patients getting everolimus, and creatinines were higher. And um, this was despite the fact that the cyclosporin levels were the same. And this was brought to my attention by a brand new transplant coordinator who um, we had hired maybe a month before. And she came to me and said, you know, I've looked at the people in this clinical trial and, and their creatinines are worse than, than our other patients. So being the open-minded clinical investigator, I said, nah, that can't be. But she came prepared. She had an Excel spreadsheet. Sure enough, it was there. So we told the sponsor, Novartis, look, we got something going on here. It may make sense to use lower doses 
of cyclosporin to try to blunt this. So it turns out there's some interaction between the mTOR inhibitors and calcineurin inhibitors that wasn't known at the time. But one thing that we found out from the study was that um, beyond two weeks post-transplant, regardless, as long as you have therapeutic efferolimus levels, regardless of your cyclosporin concentration, trough concentration, 50 or four, to 400, there's no difference in, in rejection rates. So you can actually decrease the cyclosporin levels and hopefully blunt the development of this um, renal insufficiency. So um, the next step was to do another clinical trial. This is the, became the largest clinical trial ever done in heart transplants. Um, and this is a randomized trial of everolimus with reduced dose cyclosporin versus MMF, which was now approved everywhere with standard cyclosporin doses, looking at the safety, efficacy, and the effect on development of cardiac allograft vasculopathy, similar endpoints to what I showed previously. And this is where the study was done. So it was done around the world on five continents. And these were the three arms. So this is the low-dose everolimus arm. So you can see we rapidly decreased the cyclosporin trough levels. This is the higher dose everolimus arm, and this is also decreased cyclosporin trough levels. This is the MMF arm where we continued the standard cyclosporin levels. Now, one thing that happened was um, the there was a numerical, not statistical, but numerical increase in mortality from infections in the higher dose everolimus group. And so that the DSMB said you have to stop enrolling. So we did, and it basically became a low-dose everolimus versus MMF study. Um, now, one thing that was important to look at was the effect of the mTOR inhibitors on wound healing and mediastinitis, because immediately after our first study, people started using serolimus, which was available clinically, and using in de novo patients, and they found that people were developing problems with wound healing and with uh, mediastinitis. But we really didn't find that um, in uh, in this study, which was fortunate. The one thing we did find was that there were large pericardial effusions, um, and uh, but not tamponade, although this would mean that you really do need to keep a close eye on, um, on these patients if you start at de novo. Now I'm gonna argue um, shortly that we really shouldn't use these drugs de novo in patients because of all the side effects. Um, and of course there was the IVIS arm, there was no difference in rejection between the two studies. So MMF, is, as you saw previously, is a much more effective drug for preventing rejection. But th the really interesting stuff was with the effect on IVIS. Um, and so we see here a much lower incidence of cardiac allograft vasculopathy, which we defined, as I previously discussed, in the low-dose everolimus versus MMF group, and a much and much less progression of cardiac allograft vasculopathy defined, defined by maximal intimal thickness change in the everolimus group versus MMF. And if one looked at volumetric measures here defined by MMF, by IVIS, also everolimus pretty uniformly blunted progression of disease. And this is true across numerous um, subgroups, older patients, females, diabetics, patients with donor disease, um, so it appears to be effective, even compared to MMF, in blunting the development of cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Um, so, but there was no difference in terms of rejection. And there was, if you adhere to the lower cyclosporin dose, um, you had an improvement in, in renal function, but a lot of people in this study did not pay attention to the directions. And so they kept the cyclosporin trough doses at standard levels. And so there was some renal insufficiency. So um, let's talk about the higher dose um, uh, cyclosporin arm, which was stopped by the DSMB. So it turns out that the patients who had the infections were patients who had had ventricular assist devices, um, and then were transplanted off ventricular cyst devices. And sometimes you hear about something called the center effect, which means that in the clinical trial, 
one center has such poor outcomes that they drag down the rest of the study. Well, we had a country effect. There was one country in the study that had such poor outcomes, it dragged everybody down. I'm not going to say which country it is, but it's a European country located between France and Poland or Switzerland and Denmark. So, but they had they had 64% one year survivals in all their transplant patients. And we were not aware of this until uh, later in the clinical trial. So I mentioned that using these drugs de novo is problematic. So people have been trying to figure out how to use them successfully later on post-transplant. This is the scheduled trial from Scandinavia where patients are randomized to get everolimus at seven to 11 weeks and have cyclosporin completely withdrawn, stay in MMF and corticosteroids, or they stayed on cyclosporin, MMF, and corticosteroids. And sure enough, the Everolimus group had less progression of cardiac allograft vasculopathy compared to um, using numerous measures compared to the group getting cyclosporin, but no Everolimus. And even with the presence of, um, oh, and, and there was lower incidence of disease as well. Um, now, there were some patients who had without cyclosporin, who had several episodes of 2R rejections. And so there was no hemodynamic compromise in mortality, but these people had to have low-dose cyclosporin added to their regimen. And renal function was better in the Everolimus group because they were largely off cyclosporin. And one thing has been noted throughout the whole, all the clinical trials of the mTOR inhibitors, there's less cytomegalovirus infection. Cytomegalovirus is a very common opportunist, opportunistic infection uh, in transplant patients. And for some reason, the mTOR inhibitors seem to reduce that. Um, now, the, perhaps the most of the work that was done at post-transplant mTOR inhibitors is from the Mayo Clinic. They did a study um, where they converted people to serolimus about a year out post-transplant. If you do it later, uh, you may be too late and people may develop cardiac allograft vasculopathy. But what they found was using IVIS, there was less progression when you switch them at one year in the serolimus group versus the CNI group. So the people were off of CNI. And we see this here too, less progression, less progression. And here's the really interesting stuff. They actually had outcome data which showed um, less cardiac, all-cause cardiac death, um, less, less all-cause death, less cardiac death, and less cardiac allograft-related uh, events. So switching people later from CNIs to um, mTOR inhibitors improves outcomes. And that's very exciting. So that's where I think these drugs at this point play a role. And that's what we see here. Uh, lower incidence, instance of CAV-related um, deaths. This is the CNI group. This is the late conversion of serolimus. Early conversion, early means at one year. So mTOR inhibitors when started later after transplant can attenuate the development of cardiac allograft vasculopathy, favorably influencing outcomes such as MACE and death. And these strategies can mitigate the issues of renal dysfunction and wound healing and issues with infection that were seen in de novo patients. So what do we do with the patients who have established cardiac allograft vasculopathy? So there was a clinical trial at Columbia when Dr. Mancini was there. Um, she randomized people to stay on control medications or get serolimus. And what she showed using something called a catheterization score was um, in the serolimus group, there was less progression. And if one looked at a, at a composite of the catheterization score, death MI, or need for intervention, there was greater freedom in the serolimus group than the uh, in the control group. This is from a, a study in a Spanish group where they took patients with angiographic IV, um, and IVIS defined um, cardiac allograft vasculopathy and either decreased their cyclosporin, added everolimus, or continued them in cyclosporin, azathioprine, MMF. They had it was a very small clinical trial, so they found no difference in terms of clinical endpoints. They did actually successfully reduce the um, calcineurin uh, trough doses, 
And so th this is this is the um, clinical outcomes, no difference. Uh, but they did do IVIS, and let me get to the graphics. So here, there was less progression with Everolimus than with um, standard approaches. Um, so you can start these drugs late in patients with cardiac allograft, who established cardiac allograft vasculopathy, and it may be beneficial. There have only been these two small studies, and we'd love to do a big randomized trial. Um, and we were talking about it with um, Novartis about doing it with Everolimus, and then the pandemic hit, and suddenly a lot of things shut down. So uh, the mTOR inhibitors, otherwise known as proliferation signal inhibitors, reduce CMV rates, reduce incidence and severity, cardiac allograft vasculopathy, allow significant reduction of CNI doses and tar target trough levels. They may reduce the incidence of, of malignancy. I'll show this later. Sirolimus does adversely affect wound healing. These drugs potentiate nephrotoxicity of CNIs, increase rates of bacterial infections, increase serum triglycerides, and and death with infection may be used if you use concomitant thymoglobulin, which is sometimes used as induction ther therapy in the early post-transplant period. You should obtain echoes prior to discharge in de novo treated patients just to make sure they don't have significant uh, pericardial effusions or tamponade. Now, not everything works in cardiac allograft vasculopathy. This is rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. So it inhibits B cells and the production of antibodies. So an NIH-funded study was done randomizing patients in the first few months post-transplant to either get rituximab or placebo first eight weeks, and then IVIS was done at base, baseline in 12 months. Thought it'd be reduce antibodies, you reduce the likelihood of developing cardiac allograft vasculopathy. This is the random, randomization schema. But look at this. In the rituximab group, there was more cardiac allograft vasculopathy defined by IVIS compared to placebo. So why is this? It's thought that there may be a paradoxical activation using rituximab. So things are surprising. Here, here's the same um, uh, illustration from Dr. Halloran's paper showing the incredible complexity of um, of the alloimmune response to the transplanted organ. But we are getting better at managing these patients. This is survival going from the early 80s to more recently. If you notice, most of the benefits in the first six months, so that's due to reductions in infections, better ICU care, but still as one goes further out, um, there is, um, something that is reducing these patients' survival. And that's something is, one of the things is cardiac allograft vasculopathy. We've gotten a little bit better in improving outcomes, and that's mainly due, due to the widespread use of statins. Um, there's less renal dysfunction than there used to be. And that's because in 2003, there was a paper that came out from OHO and his group at Michigan, um, looking at the overall transplant um, population in the U.S., and what they found was patients with creatinines greater than 2.0 at one year had worse outcomes. And that was a wake-up call for a lot of us because previously we said, well, you know, creatinine of two is kind of the cost of doing business. And now we make very aggressive efforts to reduce calcineurin inhibitors by one year to get the creatinines under two. And I think this shows we're doing a better job. And then malignancy is the other big cause of mortality beyond the first year post-transplant. So there seems to be greater malignancy-free survival, maybe due to changes in immunosuppression. This is the functional status of patients. So you see it's pretty good at one year, three year, and five years post-transplant. Employment status, not bad. And so this is the evolution of public perception from this great miracle, to this disaster, to this miracle again. And here we go, how transplants, this is uh, um, how transplants save lives. I mentioned malignancies. So these are usually either skin malignancies, mainly squamous cell carcinomas or lymphomas. There are some specific types of lymphomas that can occur in transplant patients, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. 
And the adenocarcinomas that we usually see are not any more likely to happen in these patients, but when they do happen, they're much more aggressive. So we're very aggressive at screening patients for um, pre-existing cancers. So we do we use the American Cancer Society uh, schema, and we'll do colonoscopies and uh, mammographies, and in smokers, CT scans of the lungs to make sure there's no lung cancer. Um, this is maintenance immunosuppression. So you can see um, tacrolimus has really displaced cyclosporin. People are small numbers of people are still getting mTOR inhibitors. Um, MMF has replaced azathioprine. And there's still a fair number of people on prednisone, which I find puzzling because when I was at Temple, we conducted a study where we got people off prednisone six months to one year and showed the outcomes were really unchanged, but there were fewer um, um, adverse events related to steroids. So uh, that's become our norm and a lot of other programs have done that as well. And this is maintenance immunosuppression at one in five years. Again, tacrolimus and MMF are the major drugs that are used. Uh, now, if a patient develops malignancy, the outcomes are much worse. I mentioned they can be very aggressive. So the relationship of malignancies to immunosuppression is still evolving. It does appear the duration and intensity of immunosuppression increases cancer risk. Um, people are evaluating lower min minimal immunosuppression regimens and the frequency and components of cancer screening may be something more intensive than the American Cancer Society approach is needed. One thing we did at Hahnemann with our dermatology group is we had a transplant dermatology program um, where patients would go and get screened to look for squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, and it was very effective at identifying people who needed interventions. Um, so I mentioned that the mTOR inhibitors may affect development of malignancy. Here's everolimus and mTOR. It turns out, just to talk about a little bit of molecular biology, a lot of malignancies have mutations in, um, in P53 and some of the molecular breaks on proliferation. So mTOR becomes very important in terms of driving proliferation of malignant cells. Everolimus inhibits that. And this is a, a study of the SRTR, which is of, in kidney transplant patients, which is the national database showing that um, patients who just get mTOR inhibitors or mTOR inhibitors and cyclosporin have much lower rate or tacrolimus have much lower rates of malignancies than patients who get cyclosporin and tacrolimus. And there have been clinical trials looking at the effect of mTOR inhibitors on cancers. While we were doing our transplant trial, there was another everolimus trial, Bolero 2, with very high doses of everolimus in patients with metastatic breast cancer who had progression despite endocrine therapy. And it showed that there was less progression, less events in patients who got everolimus. So everolimus and other mTOR inhibitors are approved as adjunctive therapies, patients with breast cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and a few others. So anybody who's seen a transplant patient get endomyocardial biopsies and talk to them afterward knows that they're, they're not really very comfortable and patients are not big fans of these. We use them because transplant management is a tightrope between lower immunosuppression, rejection, maybe cardiac allograft vasculopathy, higher doses, cancer, toxicity, and infections. So one thing that I've been trying to work on for many years was develop an ideal rejection screening test, which should be highly sensitive for rejection, and adverse outcomes, Negative tests strongly associated with good prognosis. Positive test indicates need for treatment for further workup, non or less invasive, can easily be done as an outpatient, low complication rate, decreased costs. So one thing that I became interested in was looking at um, changes in gene expression profiling, gene expression rather, in peripheral blood lymphocytes and mononuclear cells, which are the cells that mediate the autoimmune response. And so we embarked on something called the CARGO study, which is the Cardiac Allograft Rejection Gene Observation Clinical Trial. 
where we developed, we identified genes um, uh, the, whose expression increased or decreased in peripheral blood in patients who had 2R rejection compared to grade zero and developed a um, 14 gene algorithm. This is a microarray which shows, oops, out here you can see, oh, this is, this is, we did a microarray which defined the genes. Then we compared blood samples from patients with 2R versus zero to confirm there was a difference. And then we did it in all comers. So candidate gene selection, algorithm development, and validation. And this is what's called a heap map. Um, so genes here either are downgraded or upgraded when there's 2R rejection compared to grade zero. And these are the genes that are involved and they're also a number, so you see it in numerous different pathways. There are a number of genes that whose expression doesn't change. And those are what are called housekeeping genes or internal controls. And there's some evidence that some of the stem cell activation genes may be activated at the time of rejection. So in terms of scores, the, this algorithm, which became the Alamap, had scores. So it could distinguish 2R from zero. And uh, you see very successfully with a very high negative prediction, negative predictive value. So in other words, low scores means the likelihood of having a 2R rejection uh, are extremely low. You don't need to biopsy, biopsy those patients. And here's the other interesting thing. So for this clinical study, we had a panel of very high, very well-regarded pathologists who looked at all these biopsies. And what they found was that the, the pathologist in the study um, overcalled a lot of the rejections. They disagreed 62% of the time with rejection 2R or 3R. So what this means is that the local pathologists were over calling rejection. And the local pathologists were also very, very experienced. So these are not a bunch of fly-by-night pathologists. And maybe the difference is that the local pathologists had skin in the game. These were their patients. So they had to make sure they, they didn't miss anything. Um, whereas the, the panel of pathologists who just overread biopsies weren't involved in patient care. But here's an example. So this is something called a quality effect. This is looks like rejection. The local pathologist called it a rejection, but a quality effect is just subendocardial lymphocytic infiltration. It doesn't mean rejection. It's named after an early Stanford transplant patient. So many of the quality effects were called rejection by the central panel. There was another cargo study, cargo two, mainly in Europe, and they found the same thing that, that we did in cargo one, which was that. Um, less than one third of endomyocardial biopsies agreed, um, assigned to 2R, 3R were agreed upon by the reviewing pathologist. So once again, overcalling rejection. Um, so it points out to the limitation of endomyocardial biopsies. So where are we now? Well, we started out with um, clinical evidence of rejection. People come in heart failure, AFib, usually they died. Then biopsy was introduced to provide surveillance biopsies. So you could identify people with earlier rejection. And now we have molecular tests and we can even identify people who are at risk for developing rejections. So positive predictive value of this test is low. So people have elevated scores. We usually end up doing biopsies, but it doesn't mean they're gonna have rejection. And when I went to Hahnemann in March, 2005, we were the first program in the world to introduce using um, the gene expression profiling to reduce biopsies. And this was our algorithm. There was a randomized trial published in 2010 led by Mike Pham from Stanford, where they randomized patients to either have gene expression profiling guided management or biopsy guided management. And um, there were 600 patients randomized. Um, they were randomized either the biopsy or to gene expression profiling. It was endpoint driven. These are the endpoints, and these are the um, the points of analysis. So this is how they randomized patients. If the score was less than threshold, 
patients did not get biopsied. If it was above threshold, they did get biopsied. And here's one of the flaws in this study. So most rejection occurs in the first six months. Yet if you notice, all these patients were studied later, and most of them studied beyond the first year. So they really were looking at patients beyond when rejection happened. Not surprisingly, no difference in survival, no difference in the primary endpoint, composite endpoint, which I showed you before. And there, no surprise, far more biopsies in the biopsy arm than in the non-biopsy arm. And again, I point out the low um, predictive uh, uh, value of the elevated score. Patients who got biopsies seldom had rejection, even if they had elevated scores. And here's a big surprise, not really. Patients who were in the non-biopsy group just getting blood tests had better patient satisfaction than those who had were getting biopsies. I mentioned limitations in the study, but here's an interesting subgroup analysis. This was in patients whose scores were below threshold. So they looked at, at this one group that was in the lowest quartile compared to the, to the other groups. And what they found was that, that um, these patients in the lower quartile were less likely to be on steroids, less likely to have treated rejections or any SAEs, and less likely to reach the composite endpoint. So what does this mean? It means that there are patients who can be identified who are immunologically privileged and in whom immunosuppression can be weaned. And the one interesting observation is these are people who are negative for CMV. Um, and there have been some studies looking at weaning of immunosuppression um, guided by gene expression profiling. This is the E-image study from Cedars-Sinai where they looked at people between um, uh, two months and one year, six months post-transplant. One problem with the Alimap, it cannot be used in the first two months because the steroid doses are higher and can actually affect the score. And so they had similar primary endpoints. They did IVIS and um, small study. Um, this is their randomization scheme. So there was really no difference in endpoints, uh, significant difference, no difference in uh, um, event events, far more biopsies, and a very low positive predictive value and a very high negative predictive value, as we've seen before. And patients could be weaned off steroids using gene expression profiling. Uh, here, here's the weaning, and no difference in in IVIS. So. This can really be started beginning two months post-transplant and beyond, and we've, that's what we've done. Um, and as I mentioned, there's immunosuppression, suppressive weaning. This is from the Mayo Clinic Scottsdale. They're able to reduce endomyocardial biopsies, get people off steroids entirely or on very low levels. And as a result of all this, using gene expression profiling was introduced in the first uh, ISHLT guidelines for the management of heart transplant recipient. It was level of, of evidence B, class 2A. I believe now it's level of evidence A in the 2022 guidelines because there are now at least two clinical trials that show that it can work. There's another way of molecular diagnostic test, which is more of a rule-in test. And this is um, donor-derived cell-free DNA, which is a marker of algraft injury. And let's just, so there is, in a baseline amount of turnover of cells, and that results in donor-derived cell-free DNA. But in acute rejection, there's more damage, so you should have an increase in donor-derived cell-free DNA floating around in the plasma. And this will spike with rejection. This was developed at Stanford. And you can see treatment of rejection reduces it. And the healthy patients, those close to rejection numbers go up, those with rejection goes up for it. So it can even potentially predict um, the development of rejection. This is from the University Medical College of Wisconsin, which suggests some vasculopathy patients may also develop elevations in, um, in donor-derived cell-free DNA, which is not a surprise because it's a marker of allograft injury, which ha happens with CAV. The one thing that this test can look at is antibody-mediated rejection, which is another form of rejection tends to occur later than cellular rejection, but is not picked up by the Alimap.
So this is uh, another clinical trial, uh, not clinical trial, but observational study. This is donor-derived cell-free DNA. Um, so the number of, with injury, the number of, of copies of donor-derived uh, cell-free DNA goes up. And you can see this here. Two R rejections, treat it, goes down. Even antibody media rejections, you have an increase uh, here as well. So this is the promising technology. It's a rule-in test. When we see it elevated, we will do biopsies. Nowadays, we get this in conjunction with gene expression profiling. And this shows the difference in um, percent donor-derived cell-free DNA, quiescent versus rejecting patients, and in patients with treated rejections. And it tends to increase prior to an actual rejection. So what this means is that you can stop um, immunosuppressive weaning and optimize immunosuppression if you see a rise so you don't get a rejection. And this is basically what we're talking about here. Um, and I've shown this too, two R rejections, spike with rejection, treatment brings it down. Um, so the limitations are that uh, there have been no randomized studies. There are some studies being done to look at this. It's not organ specific so that if you have um, uh, a multi-organ transplant, let's say a heart kidney, you don't know which organs being um, is rejecting. So it may be very useful as non-invasive surveillance cardiac of uh, cardiac uh, allograft status. And this was very helpful during the pandemic because we did not want our patients to go to the hospital or to an outside lab. And we were able to deploy blood drawing teams to um, patients' homes and get um, gene expression profiling, donor-derived cell-free DNA. If neither of these were elevated, we told the patients not to come to the hospital. If they were elevated, we would have them come and get biopsied. The SHORE study is a registry looking at um, all comers and looking at whether donor-derived cell-free DNA pre predicts the development of um, acute cellular rejection, antibody mediated rejection, or cardiac allograft vasculopathy. It's ongoing. Um, there is a study called the DETECT study, which we're going to start. This uses uh, a different type of donor-derived cell-free DNA by a different company. Um, but we're going to look at this as a predictor of cardiac allograft vasculopathy. It's an observational study. So, um, but as I've shown previously, vasculopathy is slightly less likely to happen because of uh, statins. Renal dysfunction, less likely to happen because we're smarter using immunosuppression. That's why malignancy is less likely to happen. So what are some of the really radically new things? One is don um, donation after cardiac death. Um, and this was introduced first in, um, in Australia because they have wide distances between hospitals where there are donors and recipients, and in the UK, where there's a real short shortage of donors. And remember, I told you the very first heart transplant was probably a DCD transplant. And they put the heart, so basically uh, the donor is taking off um, life support, the heart's allowed to slow down. Then they put it in this ex vivo perfusion system and um, it results in, uh, and then it's taken and transplanted. And this shows in Britain, um, the number of in, the number of transplants, the uh, increase in transplants. So DCD donation saved um, cardiac transplantation in the UK. And now we're doing it in the United States. There's a study with transmedics. Um, and the one thing is it appears to be more expensive to do DCD because some of these people have what's called primary graft dysfunction, which means the heart doesn't perk up right away after transplant and may need ECMO support. Um, what else is being done to expand donor heart availability? Well, one thing is to use hepatitis C positive organs. There are now highly effective and curative therapies for hepatitis C that can be eradicated. And um, so we introduced that at Hershey and our numbers went up significantly and we've had no patients. Everybody gets infected. We've had no patients develop hepatitis C.
The other thing is using organs from donors who died of the opioid op opioid overdoses. Um, there's enhanced screening for uh, um, high risk infections, but those tend to be younger donors, and uh, so they tend to do well. Um, obviously, if we could er eradicate opioid addiction, we would do that. You know, even if it meant having fewer donors. And then the one really interesting thing is xenotransplantation, where there is molecular modification of the pig heart using CRISPR-Cas9 editing to remove out, remove swine lymphocytic antigens, which are targets of the immune system, porcine endothelial um, retroviruses, which in humans, if they get activated, could be lethal. And they may, and also introducing um, uh, human-specific complement inhibitors, because otherwise, um, human complement will destroy the uh, pig transplant. And this will make um, pig transplants safer. Uh, this is me at the um, in Cape Town at the 2017 um, 50th anniversary uh, symposium of the first heart transplant. Um, so, and I'll talk about uh, pig transplants in a few minutes. So, what have we learned? Basic science and immunology is important. Always listen to your transplant coordinators. Many challenges are left, but we're making progress. Too, many, too much immunosuppression is not a good thing. And be prepared to be surprised, as in CTOT 11. And I was reading an article about Dr. Fauci, and he said the exact same thing. Be prepared to be surprised. So I've shown this before. Let's just talk very briefly about VADs, and I'll explain why in a second. So, oops. Um, so survival with VADs has improved significantly. The number of VADs being done, they're mainly destination therapy because of the new organ allocation system that doesn't favor VADs. Um, and the ideal VAD would be a totally implantable one, what's called a durable forgettable system, which would reduce the risk of infections. Um, so a, a newer VAD, the HeartMate 3, was introduced compared to HeartMate 2 and had uh, had better outcomes, much less graft, uh, much less pump thrombosis, which was very significant, less stroke, less arrhythmias, less GI bleeding. So there are more VADs being performed in transplant. The other thing about VADs, there's no waiting time. And, um, but there's more experience longitudinally with heart transplants than VADs. And longer individual post-transplant survivals with transplant than with VADs. And strokes continue to be a problem, even with the newest VADs. Post-transplant complications I've discussed. I talked about DCD. Now, xenotransplant, there was a xenotransplant heart performed in January 2022 at uh, the University of Maryland. Bart Griffith led the team. And there was a very talented immu uh, immunologist, Mohammed Mahoudin, who was the architect behind the genetic uh, um, changes. And so... Dr. Mahoudin and Dr. Griffith have organized a, a working group called X-Wing, Xenotransplant Working and Investigative Group, which includes a number of us. So we're looking at trying to decide who the next person for a xenotransplant should be. That'll be done at the University of Maryland. What should the immunosuppression be? What should the follow-up be? And how do we look for infections and treat infections? This patient who lived 57 years 57, sorry, 57 days. Now, remember that. First xenotransplant lived 57 days. First heart transplant, 67, 18 days. This first xenotransplant actually died of porcine cytomegalovirus infection, which caused endothelial swelling and ischemia. So something that we know about now, we can try to screen and treat. Um, so who should get VADs? and who should get transplants. There's a lot of arguments about this. VAD outcomes are getting better. Should younger patients get transplants because of better long-term survival? Or should VADs go to younger patients um, so they don't need transplant for long periods of time? Or have shown this. Oh. So VADs need to be optimized before a clinical trial against transplants undertaken. They need to be totally implantable improved durability with minimal stroke rate. Um, and medical complications of VADs, GI bleeding, hypertension. Um, so you have to keep the, the mean arterial pressures under 70. 
infection, CVA, and right ventricular failure. Oops. So will we see a VAD versus transplant trial? I think we might if the VADs improve. Now, VADs, this is the latest information from the momentum study of the HeartMate 3. There's a 58% five-year survival with VADs, which is actually quite good. It's not as good as with transplants, but it's beginning to approximate it. So, and I just wanted, with the very first destination therapy study, the rematch study, which was 20 years ago, uh, the one-year survival for VAD patients was one was 50%. So at the ISHLT, you're going to see the president's debate. There'll be a debate as to whether the future management of advanced heart disease is either biological with transplants with improved immunosuppression, xenotransplants, or mechanical with improved um, with improved FADs. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you. And I guess we'll have a panel discussion now. Thank you, Dr. Eisen. Um, uh, if you would um, uh, bring down the slides and then we can have the focus discussion. I don't think we will have a lot of time left. We really enjoyed the very comprehensive uh, overview. And I'll let uh, Deepa go right away into any uh, specific question. And then I might come up with a one more question, and I just want to be mindful of the time and uh, want to respect everybody's uh, uh, time for uh, getting back to your dinner and other things. So, uh, Deepa. Thank you, Partho. Dr. Eisen, that was a fascinating and comprehensive review of the entire evolution of immunosuppression. And, and you walked long. us through the journey of uh, heart transplant. I cannot believe it's 55 years and counting. You know, like you mm -hmm. rightly said, the first transplanted uh, person lived 18 days. I mean, right now, I guess the average graph span is around 15 years and counting. So I have two mm -hmm. questions for you, uh, which you already alluded to, but I just want to do it, uh, you know, put it out there. So you talked about the concept of the Achilles heel for, of transplantation in terms of rejection surveillance, you know, is immunosuppression and how to maintain the balance between infection, cancer, and toxicity with that of uh, rejection. Uh, do you think at this point with the evolution of cell-free DNA that there is a age where we can predict immunosenescence? Um, you know, that's what we're trying to find out with the uh, detect study and some of these other registries. Um, um, there's also something called the iBox, which is a, by look, it's artificial intelligence up Dr. Sengupta's alley, but looking at donor and recipient characteristics, you can predict people who are at risk of developing cardiac allograft vasculopathy. So there's four trajectories, two of the tra trajectories, people are at risk of developing this. And in two of them, they're not. So in those two, um, those are people who perhaps can have their immunosuppression weaned. I showed you the substudy from the image study, mm -hmm. which is that people who chronically have low Alamaps may be people who are immunoprivileged, and therefore we can wean immunosuppression. Um, and, you know, there are going to be people, young women, allosensitized people who are going to be at higher risk um, of developing rejection. But I think um, I think we will be able to do this. So if you want me to kind of make a prediction, I think that we're going to be able to get to the point where we can use these molecular markers to um, identify immuno, immunosenescence, immunoquiescence. Um, there's some other markers there too, um, microRNAs mm -hmm. and clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate um, uh, prognosis, which even though it has kind of a nebulous name, may be a predictor of cardiac allograft vasculopathy. So I think that we will be able to use these. I think we will see xenotransplantation become a reality within the next five years. Some people say, well, you know, why don't you just retire at this point? So, well, I want to see xenotransplant become a reality. I want to see molecular diagnostic tests become a reality. And there are some places, including Stanford, where they just do two biopsies a year. They do, so you, can, you can't really do donor-derived cell-free DNA in the first two weeks post-transplant because there's washout from the transplant operation. So there are elevated donor-derived cell-free DNA levels. So they do them in the first two weeks and that's it. And I think that uh, 
That's where a lot of us are going to be going. At Hershey, we were doing about six a year, mainly because we were in an NIH-funded clinical trial, a randomized trial of tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 drug versus placebo, to see if we can reduce the likelihood of, of developing AMR, antibody-mediated rejection. Um, and that really required a few additional biopsies. Um, but otherwise, I could see going down to two. But there is something also called the molecular microscope, which is something that um, Phil Halloran, the immunosuppression, the immunotransplant immunology guru, has been doing, where he looks at biopsies and shows changes in, in gene expression intragraft in the biopsy. So he has patterns that he can use to identify bad outcomes. The only problem is no one has figured out, okay, you identify one of these bad outcomes, what do you do? Um, so, um, but I think that we were going to see a lot less biopsies than than um, we did previously. Um, and my my feeling is that at some centers, they continue to, to do biopsies because they're RVU driven. In other words, you do biopsies, you get more RVUs, it looks good. Um, but I, I don't think that should be a reason to do biopsies. So I mentioned xenotransplant. I do think we're going to have within the next five years. So five years from, from now, if I'm wrong, just tell me I was wrong. But um, we are going to have durable VADs that will be totally implantable and that will be more um, hemocompatible mm -hmm. so that they're going to be less likely to cause strokes. And th those may actually give transplant a real run for its money, a real competition. So I think the future is going to be a lot of you know exciting things for people with advanced heart failure. But even before we get to advanced heart failure, we now have four arms of gold derived uh, medical therapy, which has been, you know, really tremendous. Um, when I first started doing transplant, this is a dirty little secret, but, um, you know, most of those patients probably nowadays would have done fine, would, have, would not have needed transplant because they would, could have gotten GDMT and could have done better. We didn't have GDMT back then. The idea of using a beta blocker in somebody with heart failure was anathema. So, but now we have a lot, we can now even prevent people from needing advanced therapies, but there always will be people who will need them. And those people, um, we have options that will get better. So it's an exciting time. So thank you. Me, yeah, go ahead. No, I think you answered my second question about xenotransplantation and how real that is, you know, with genetically engineered uh, pigs and, you know, the allogenic immunity. I think uh, you're pretty confident that in the next five years, we're going to achieve more yeah. of that. Yep, I am. And um, and the ISHLT, there's going to be a very fine talk by uh, Bob Montgomery, the oh, director yes. of the Transplant Institute at NYU, about um, xenotransplantation. So he's been doing things a little differently. He puts pig hearts and pig kidneys in cadavers and people who are brain dead, he puts them in there. So it's kind of a different approach from what Bart Griffith is doing at, um, at Maryland. But I think that we're going to see Bart doing more. We're going to start identifying patients and kind of figure out what kind of immunosuppression we should use. Thank you. So Harvey, I was, I was having a burning question before we come bring this uh, session to close. Uh, so I know that you're coming here and what kind of clinical trial, what kind of research armamentarium? And I, I think we had some uh, interesting discussion. Uh, would you be bringing with you and what is, what is the future looking like uh, in, in terms of research and other clinical trial opportunities in advanced heart failure at RWJ? With your well, so I think we're going to bring the all-in study, which is the tocilizumab study. And we're going to bring the detect study, which is looking at the ability of donor-derived cell-free DNA to predict cardiac allograft vasculopathy, then I'd like to look at the IBOX and look at the two tiers of patients identified by the IBOX who are more likely to develop cardiac allograft vasculopathy and then do an mTOR study in those patients, randomize them to mTOR versus standard therapy. And the rationale is that <clears throat> those are people for whom the risk-benefit ratio has changed. So the benefit, um, the, the risk is lower. The risk is probably the same. The benefit's higher because these are people who otherwise will develop cardiac allograft vasculopathy. So they need something to, to impede that versus um, 
in the de novo studies that I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of people enrolled in the study will never develop CAV, yet they're going to have the risk of getting these drugs. And of course, we wouldn't start it early. We'd probably use the Mayo Clinic approach of starting a year out, which seems to be a way of minimizing bad outcomes and improving uh, good outcomes. So that's one thing I would see us doing. And, you know, who knows what else is going to be there? I think there's going to be other VADs. There's another VAD that's being studied, uh, the Everheart in the competence trial. Um, we, we put, our surgeons put two of those in at Hershey, really nice device that has few complications. So I'm going to meet with them at the ISHLT and see if we can get them uh, on board. And um, so another Fantastic. Possibility. Fantastic. I think, I think this is going to be a great uh, uh, accentuation to the program. Uh, uh, and we're really looking forward to having you. I think I, I just wanted to send out a very strong message that uh, uh, Within a couple of months, uh, we are hoping to see a very energized uh, heart failure VAT transplant uh, program at uh, RWJ and really looking forward to welcoming you. Thank you. So this is going to be a very important um, aspect of uh, the transformation of cardiology that we are seeking uh, at RWJ and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Good Thank night, you everyone. very much. Yes. Thank have, you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you.